This is our last video for section 6.5. This is distributing objects into boxes. So this slide is a great recap and I'm going to try just to not write on this slide at all. I suggest that you take a screenshot of this, that you have it available or write your own copy of it uh, because it's a great recap of everything that we've just learned about permutations without repetition. Uh, combinations without repetition, and then what happens when you have a permutation with repetition with distinct objects, uh, combinations with repetition, and then a permutation with indistinguishable objects, which is what we just talked about. So this is just a great reference for you to come back to whenever you need to make sure you know the formula that you should be using. So together we're going to take a look at four different questions and those questions will be based on whether the objects are distinguishable and whether the boxes are distinguishable. So there's a lot of questions in combinatorics that can be tackled using this same mindset whether or not we're talking about boxes or bins or people. So you get the idea that we can tackle a lot of different things using these methods. So the first question says, how many ways are there to distribute five card poker hands from 52 cards to each of three players? So we can see that there are three different players and that there are 52 different cards and we're looking at the five card poker hand. So what we want to do is we want to look at how are we going to set this up? Well, if there's 52 cards, player one gets five of them. Now, does it matter the order in which we give that player the cards? No, because a poker hand is a poker hand. Now, if we've given 52 cards to player one, there are 47 cards left for player two, and we're going to give that person five. For player three, we're going to look at 42 cards left and we're giving that player five cards. So if I were to find my solution, it would be 52 factorial over five factorial, 47 factorial, and then times 47 factorial over five factorial, 42 factorial, and then times 42 factorial over 5 factorial, 37 factorial. Now just as when we looked at this before, we see that the 47 and the 42 cancel out, and my result is 52 factorial, and then we've got 5 factorial, 5 factorial, 5 factorial, and then 37 factorial. So it's kind of like that multinomial coefficient, except that I still have this 37 factorial left over. Um, and again, that would just represent the 37 cards that are not being chosen. So this one actually does have a, um, a closed formula. And the closed formula says take n factorial, so there's 52 cards, and we've got k distinguishable boxes. And so what we're saying is the first box gets five because that's player one. The second box gets five because that's player two. The third box gets five because that's player three. And the fourth box gets 37 because that's the cards that are left over out of 52. So that's the tricky part here is that there are in fact 37 cards left over. So that was distinguishable and distinguishable. Now we've got identical objects or indistinguishable objects, but still distinguishable boxes. So there's 10 identical tokens and bins labeled one through five distinguishable boxes. So when you've got something like this, we should think back to the linear equation model. I've got the first box, the second box, the third box, the fourth box, and the fifth box, and I need to distribute 10 into that. So how did we do this before? We said, okay, that's five, choose 10. So whenever you have the linear equation model, you're using the combinations with repetition model. Five choose 10 says take five plus 10, which is 15 minus one. So that's 14 choose 10, which is 14 factorial over 
10 factorial, 4 factorial. And again, I would leave it just like that. Again, this is just that combinations with repetition model. Um, and again, I suggest that you use the linear equation model to help you to get that set up. Um, but whether you do or not, you would still get the same solution using the combinations with repetition model. Now we have distinguishable objects and indistinguishable boxes. And for me, this is the hardest one to get my mind around. Um, but here I'm looking at four employees into three identical lockers where each locker can be used for zero to three employees. So obviously the employees are distinguishable. We'll just call them A, B, C, D. Um, and the lockers are identical. So I keep wanting to permutate with the lockers and that's where I keep getting the strong. Um, so hopefully you don't make the same mistakes that I do. But what we're going to do here is we're not going to have a closed formula like we did for the other two cases that we've already looked at. So here I'm looking at just breaking it down into how could this have happened. So if I've got four employees and three lockers, I could put all four into one, except it tells me that I can't, zero to three employees. So I can put three into one and one into another, two into one and two into another, or two into one and one in each of the others. So let's take a look at how I would work this out. So case one, case one says I've got four employees and I'm going to choose three of them because there are four employees and I'm choosing three to go into one of the lockers and then there's one left over. Now I could say one choose one, but we all know that that solution's one anyway, so it's not gonna matter. So four choose three. The second one says I've got two and one. So four choose two and then two and another. So again, two choose two. Now two choose two is just gonna be one, so I don't really need that. But here's the tricky part. Because we're looking at two and two, let's say in the first locker, mm -hmm. I put A and B. And in the second locker, that leaves C and D. Well, what if in the first locker, I put C and D? Well, that would leave A and B for the other locker that I'm using. So notice these are the same. And typically when we're doing combinations, we can account for that, but because we've got two and two, we're not accounting for that. So this is actually divided by two. Again, to account for this problem right here, where I've got two that are the same. Now for the last one, I have two in one, so that's four choose two. Now, a lot of people would be tricked into taking two choose one and then one choose one. But again, because it doesn't matter, I've just got the two people who are going to be by themselves. I don't want to permutate those because the lockers are identical. So I don't need this. All I need is four choose two. So for four choose three, that's four factorial over three factorial, one factorial, which is four. Or there's case two. In case two says four choose two is four factorial, two factorial, two factorial, but then divided by two, which is six divided by two or three. And then four choose two is four factorial over two factorial, two factorial, which is six. So total, what I'm looking at is four plus three plus six, which is 13 different ways. So 13 is the correct solution, but again, there's a lot of stumbling blocks in this problem. Making sure you get the cases right to begin with, making sure you remember to divide by two for the first, or so for case two, and then making sure you don't make the mistake of taking two choose one, one choose one for the other choices in case three. So again, no closed formula for this one. It's just a matter of working through it um, and asking questions. For our last example together, we have indistinguishable objects and indistinguishable boxes. And this one is actually um, deceptively simple. So let's say I've got five copies of a book. I've got three identical boxes. So the books are the same. The boxes are the same. I've listed out the cases. Case one, I've got all five boxes, all five books in one box, zero in the others. 
Case two, four and one, one and another. Case three, three and one, two and another. Case four, three and one, one in each of the others. And case five, two and one, two and another, and one in the last. So the question is, how many ways can we do this? Well, we can do it five ways. Five ways because that's how many cases that I came up with. So this is where it gets kind of tricky because you want to say, oh, well, let's see, there's four choose one, but then there's one and another and we can permutate which box. Nope, the books are the same, the boxes are the same. So, you know, I could say this is five, zero, and zero, and then zero, and then five, and then zero, and then zero, and zero, and five, except all of these are the same because the boxes are the same and the books are the same. So really, it's just the five ways. Again, there's no closed formula. It's just a matter of reasoning through. Here's your last practice question, and there's one of each type. Um, again, you might not be able to apply the closed form expression. You really just have to think through each one, um, especially when they give you something like each box must have at most one ball in it. Things like that can really kind of mess you up. So don't rely too much on trying to apply those closed form functions that we talked about. Just think through each one. When you're ready, press play to see how you did. So for the first one, we've got five balls and seven boxes, and they are um, balls and boxes are labeled. So what I'm thinking about here is I've got my seven boxes, and for the first box, there are seven balls I could put into, I'm sorry, for the first ball, I could put it in one of seven boxes. And for the second ball, I could put it in one of six boxes. And for the third ball, I could put it in one of five boxes, and so on and so forth. So really, this is just seven times six times five times four times three, which incidentally is the same as a permutation of seven comma five. And that gives us 2,500 20. So again, that's where both are labeled. So we care about the order because the boxes are labeled and the balls um, are also labeled. For B, the balls are labeled, but the boxes are unlabeled. So again, if you think about the seven boxes, whoa, that's a crazy box. We've got seven boxes that are all unlabeled. So the fact that the balls are labeled really doesn't matter because these boxes are identical. So really, I'm just putting a ball into a box and it doesn't matter if this is one and this is two or if this is two and this is one mm -hmm. because we're going to end up with the exact same result. So how many ways are there to do it? There's just one way. I put the balls in the boxes. For C, the balls are unlabeled, but the boxes are labeled. So because the boxes are labeled, that makes it a little bit trickier. Um, when the boxes are labeled, I'm really looking at where am I going to put the balls? So I have seven boxes and I'm choosing the five to put the, the balls in. So it's just seven choose five. So not super complicated, that gives me 21. For the last one, both the balls and the boxes are unlabeled. Well, that's gonna be exactly like B, where the boxes are unlabeled. So the boxes are unlabeled here. It doesn't matter up here whether they're labeled or not labeled, it's still going to be the exact same situation. So there's just one way. Up next, we are going to revisit the principle of inclusion exclusion.